What's up everybody, I'm Matt Gary, and in this episode of Coding with the Force, we're gonna find out what object-oriented programming is and why it's so important, even in the world of Salesforce. All right, everybody, so today we are gonna talk about object-oriented programming, or OOP for short. But before we get into object-oriented programming, make sure if you actually enjoy this video to like it, because when you do, it helps to get out to more people just like you that wanna learn this stuff for free as well. So you enjoy the video, like it. Now, let's get back to object-oriented programming. Um, we're gonna figure out what it is. We'll find out what the uh, basic building blocks of object-oriented programming are, as well as what the uh, four main principles or pillars, some people call them principles, some people call them pill pillars of object-oriented programming are. And uh, hopefully by the end of it, you get a better idea uh, about what the whole situation is and how you can use it to your advantage and all that kind of stuff. So uh, first things first, I just want to say this because most of my videos revolve around Salesforce. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're a Salesforce developer or a developer in any language that's based around, uh, you know, the concept of object-oriented programming. Everything I'm going to teach you today is relevant across all of those types of languages. So um, this is kind of a very not-so-Salesforce-specific video, but it's very important even in the world of Salesforce to know what object-oriented programming is and to do your best to execute on uh, on it um, while you're writing your code, developing your code, whatever. Right. Okay, so what is object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming is basically exactly what it claims to be. It's a way to structure your code so that it represents an object, uh, the attributes of an object and the actions that that object can take or that you can take on that object um, as a user. But one of the things that I kind of have a problem with when I go out and I look at all the videos and the explanations of what object-oriented programming is, is most of the time when you see an, a definition of object-oriented programming, they use something like a car or a dog, uh, a tangible item, right? So, you know, a coffee maker, a keyboard, a computer, something like that. And while you very well may represent a car or a computer or something else like that in your code base, it's just as likely, if not more likely, that you're going to represent through object-oriented programming an intangible object. Kind of like the one that I've got in front of me right now, which is a task object. And these task objects, uh, you know, a task is not a tangible object. You can't hold it in your hand. You can't do anything with it. Somebody just says, go do this thing and you need to go do it, right? Same kind of thing with maybe an opportunity. Um, an opportunity really isn't a tangible thing, but it can be represented as an object and it should be represented as an object in uh, object-oriented programming. So when you're doing object-oriented programming, uh, you can represent both tangible and intangible elements. And that's really important. And We'll go over that in just a second, right? The other thing I just want to briefly touch on is that object-oriented programming is just a way of structuring your code. Um, and most major development languages that you run into, including Apex, the development language on the Salesforce platform, um, are going to be using object-oriented programming. But it's not the only way to structure your code. Um, you can also structure your code even in object-oriented program or uh, object-oriented languages. You can structure your code um, in other ways as well. Another popular one is functional programming, which is an, uh, a newer programming paradigm or a newer way to structure your code, or procedural programming, which is a little bit older than uh, object-oriented programming, and you'll see out there in the world as well. Those are probably the three most popular ways of structuring your code. Um, but just so you know, this is not the only way to structure code out there. It is the way that you'll see most often. 
however, and it is the way that pretty much everybody structures things in Salesforce. So just so you're aware, it's just a way to structure code and not everyone uses it, though it is the most broadly used in existence currently. <laughs> All right, so in front of me, you see uh, a class, right? And um, before I go over this class, I just want to explain what we're going to be looking at. For object-oriented programming, there are four primary building blocks. There are classes, which is what you see here, which are the blueprints of objects. So they kind of outline exactly what uh, an object can do and the important, you know, data that you should capture on an object. So classes are just blueprints of objects, as we'll see here in just a second. Um, the next are methods. And methods are essentially the actions or the things that an object can do or that you can take on an object. So for instance, here on this task object, this intangible object, I can send uh, the assigned user of a task a reminder to go do it. Or I can reassign the assigned user of a task. And there might be tons of other actions that you might want to take, and you'll represent those as methods. The third thing are attributes, right? And our attributes are our variables, or essentially our important data that we need to store for our object to be able to do what it needs to do in different scenarios, right? So a task often has an assigned user, pretty much always going to have one, uh, or it's never going to get done. And it's going to have a due date, which should, uh, anyway. So it, it's going to always have a due date as well, typically, or it's also probably not going to get done and you would log that as an attribute or a variable on or in your class. Okay, so we've got um, <clears throat> methods, our actions we can take, our attributes, our important data that we want to store on this object, and our class, which is the blueprint of the object. Now, the last thing uh, of the four building blocks of object-oriented programming is the actual object itself. Um, so let's see that in action. We have this class that is a blueprint of an object. Now, how do we use that class? Uh, we do it by in instantiating it uh, as an object. And what we'll do is create a new Apex class, and we'll just call it like task distributor or something. Distributor. I think that's how you spell it. <laughs> Maybe. And, um, you know, maybe in this class, we have a public void distribute tasks method. Oh my goodness. Don't want to capitalize your methods. And <clears throat> so to distribute these tasks, we want to be able to create the tasks. So to create the tasks, we're going to take our blueprint of a task object and initialize it as an actual object. Like so. So we're just saying, you know, we're initializing a new variable of type task object. We're naming it task object. We're setting it to a new instance of task object, like so. And then what we can do now that we have this object that we have derived from our class blueprint is we can, you know, send the assigned user a reminder, right? Or we can. Um, reassign the user of that task or whatever else. So now all of these methods, and as you could see before, uh, maybe the attributes are available to us as long as they're made public. And um, so now we've got our object, right? So we've got our class blueprint. Um, we've turned it into an object and we can turn this into as many, you know, we can create as many task objects as we want. We can make another one called task object uh, two or something. And we can create hundreds of task objects uh, from our class that is the blueprint of the object that we want to create. So pretty cool. That's what uh, 
you know, those are the uh, building blocks of object-oriented programming. This is kind of how you'll structure your code kind of for object-oriented programming. Now, the next things that we need to go over, which we'll have individual videos for that we'll go over them in much more depth, are we're referred to as the four principles or sometimes the four pillars of object-oriented programming, uh, inheritance, encapsulation, uh, polymorphism, and abstraction. And these are really the um, areas that, uh, you know, make object-oriented programming so special. So let's get into them. All right, so the first principle of object-oriented programming that we're just gonna briefly touch on is encapsulation. And I like to start here because I think this is the easiest one for people to wrap their minds around. At least it was for me. Um, encapsulation is essentially the concept of only exposing things in your class, uh, you know, your blueprint of your object, that you actually need to expose. For instance, there's a lot of things that you might not want somebody who's initializing your object to be able to set. Uh, for instance, maybe you could, maybe you had a variable called, um, you know, an integer that is the number of reminders sent, right? Something like that. And in this instance, you don't want anybody else to set this, right? Because this is just kind of like a counter for this object to say, well, I've sent Matt 15 reminders about this task now, right? And so in this case, what we wanna do is hide that, right? So even though it is an important data point for our object, it's something that only the object has access to. People like you and I, when we're initializing the, uh, the task object to send things out, we wouldn't be able to set them like I am here for the assigned user, right? Um, this would just be something that is kind of hidden implementation uh, that the object itself sets when it starts running. And the same thing can be said about methods. Maybe there are methods in here that your public methods use, but you don't want to be called independently because, you know, again, an outside user, somebody who's actually initializing a task object should never set them themselves or should never call them themselves. So for instance, maybe we have a private method um, called, uh, I don't know, increment, increment, uh, well, reminder, remind, oh my goodness, reminder, reminders, I don't know. Then <clears throat> you actually incremented this number that we set that's private, like so. Well, you don't want anybody else to call this. You want the object to you know to have this method, and you know maybe you want that to be called here and send, oops, and send a assigned user a reminder. You'd call increment reminders like so, but no one else can access this, you know, aside from this class. For instance, if I came over here to task distributor and I said task object two dot, you know. Uh, increment reminders, it would tell me that the method doesn't exist and complain about it. <clears throat> See, it says method is not visible, so you can't call it. And, um, you know, these are really important things, this concept of encapsulation, because it allows the object to have internal behaviors, be behavior uh, that the outside world isn't concerned with shouldn't be concerned with and shouldn't have to do on its own. So it kind of encapsulates all of this, uh, this local behavior of an object within your, your object itself or within the blueprint, uh, your, your class there. And this is a really, con uh, a really important concept for people to understand and for people to implement because the last thing you wanna do is have something like uh, a, a number that gets incremented that I can set out here you know, when I'm actually creating my object. That would defeat the purpose of it. And, um, you know, it would be detrimental. So encapsulation is 
super useful. Um, and it is a, you know, a very important concept uh, within object-oriented programming. The next principle or pillar of object-oriented programming that I want to go over is inheritance. And inheritance is basically exactly what it sounds like. It allows you to take one class and have it inherit the public properties and methods of another one. Kind of like if you're a parent in real life and you have a child, that child inherits a lot of your, you know, attributes, your properties, your whatever, you know, however you want to call that. They inherit a lot of things from you. It's the same way in uh, object-oriented programming. When you use the concept of inheritance, you will have, <clears throat> sorry, you'll have a child class that inherits from a parent class, and that child class will inherit all of its parents' public properties and methods. Uh, so the things like the public uh, string here, uh, and the public date, as well as these two public methods here. And, um, it's pretty cool. So let's just take a quick look at it. There's a lot to talk about with inheritance, and we're going to go over inheritance a whole lot more in the video that is specific to it. But essentially, this is how inheritance works. In Apex, anyway, you'd create a virtual class. And this uh, class right now is just kind of a generic task object, right? It's not specific. But maybe we have a more specific type of task called cool task or something. And cool task would benefit from inheriting all of the public properties of the task object here. So we're going to make this task object a virtual class. And um, <clears throat> we will save that. And then what we'll do is create a new Apex class. And we'll call it a, I don't know, awesome task or something. And the way that we essentially create a child class or tell this class that its parent is the task object is we say extends <coughs> task object. And now uh, that this awesome task extends task object, we can over here in the task distributor we could say awesome task aw task or something equals new <clears throat> awesome task and then aw task we can see we have the ability to call the reassign user method the send assigned user reminder method and set the due date in the assigned user despite the fact that none of those things are present in the awesome task uh, class, right? So pretty cool. Awesome task then gains all of the functionality of the task object without um, you know us having to rewrite that code or anything along those lines. Now I will say there is a whole lot more to talk about with inheritance, uh, specifically the design principle composition over inheritance, where people you know, make a very valid argument against using inheritance and instead use class composition. Um, we're not going to go over that all, all that right now, but in the video specific to inheritance where we go over more of the concept of inheritance in depth and uh, things like composition over inheritance, we'll talk about that. But just know that that's kind of what inheritance does. It allows one class, a child class, to inherit from its parents, which is for a parent, which is pretty cool. So, um, yeah. The next principle or pillar of object-oriented programming that I want to go over is abstraction. And abstraction, I think, is the most confusing of the four. And I say that because uh, while its definition is technically accurate, it's a little confusing to people who have never tried to put abstraction in place in code. So um, when you Google abstraction, right, uh, the common kind of definition that you'll see is that through abstraction, only essential details are displayed to the user uh, or are uh, 
presented to the class that's instantiating your object. And uh, that is true. Um, that is the goal of abstraction, to only expose, essentially, the, the really essential, necessary things for you to be able to use a class. Basically exposing the bare minimum and not showing all of the details that are hidden underneath your class. For instance, you know, in my task object here, maybe when I reassigned a user, there's a ton of complex logic in the background, right? I don't know. I mean, probably not, but maybe there is, right? And I don't want to expose the potentially, you know, couple of private methods that I would use to reassign that user. It's similar in a sense to encapsulation, which we already discussed. But the thing that's kind of lost in that definition is the fact that the goal here is to kind of provide uh, what's referred to as a common interface for classes. So <clears throat> there is this principle called programming, you know, you, you'd prefer or anyway, or you would want to try to program to an interface, not an implementation. And it, the implementation is really the details of your code that you don't want to expose to anyone. So we've got a task object and we've got an awesome task and the details of both might be different. But if we use interfaces, the task distributor class would never know or never need to know the difference between the two. And uh, this, is, this is a really challenging concept to really, I think, wrap your head around at least the first time. And uh, so I'm not going to go too much more in detail past that. We'll absolutely have a um, <laughs> video going over the uh, principle of ab abstraction and object-oriented programming, where I'll give you a really, really thorough example of this. But just know the goal is to never expose or try, rather, not to expose your details uh, of an implementation to your users or your other classes where you can avoid it. <clears throat> and by doing so, that allows you to really create some pretty uh, unique, flexible code that um, you know, is pretty cool and interesting. I've actually got a video over interfaces in Apex and how to use them. If you want to go watch it right now, it's out there and it goes over this concept a whole lot. But there's going to be another video where we go over abstraction. Just know the goal of abstraction is to hide the um, complex details and only show what is absolutely essential for other classes, users to know about. The last principle or pillar of object-oriented programming is polymorphism. And I got to tell you, this one is by far the coolest, in my opinion. If you don't know what polymorphism is, uh, it's basically exactly what it is. If you break out uh, up the word, uh, polymorphism basically means many forms, and that's exactly what will happen in your code. Your objects will be able to take on many forms, uh, which is really cool. And it can do that in two different ways. It can do that at uh, uh, compile time and dynamically as the code is running, it can take on a new form. And we're going to go over both of those really quick. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. The first one that we're going to go over is dynamic um, polymorphism, which is by far the coolest in my opinion, although static has its place or compile time uh, polymorphism has its place. Um, static or uh, sorry, dynamic polymorphism uh, essentially allows you to at runtime determine uh, you know what type of object you're actually using. And we're going to take a look at that real quick here. Um, so we have our task object, which we um, you know set up as the parent object of awesome task over here. Now, say awesome task also needs an implementation of 
send assigned user reminder. It needs its own unique implementation of it. It can't use the default one that task object uses. So what we're going to do is um, turn this into a virtual method so that we can essentially allow subclasses or child classes to make their own implementation. And we're going to just drop a debug log in here to uh, make it easier to kind of see this together. And we are going to save this. Come on over here to Awesome Task. And basically what we're going to do for Awesome Task is grab this method and override that virtual method and uh, change up the uh, debug so that we know that this is what's actually being called. OK, so now we have task object that uh, has its own version of the send assign user reminder method and awesome task, which has its own version. I'm going to save them both. And then now over here in the task distributor uh, that we built together a little while ago, we're going to change task object to and say, I want this to be of type awesome task. And as you can see, these are both uh, of type task object, but this one is being initialized as an awesome task instead of just a regular task object, which is pretty cool uh, in itself. But essentially task object has now taken on a new form of awesome task. And <clears throat> if we just call this sin assigned user reminder on both of them, we um, will be able to see that at runtime, it's going to figure out, OK, this is an awesome task. And we need to use this version of the uh, method instead of you know, the default version or the parents version of that method. So we'll save that. Then I've got a uh, short Apex Anonymous script that I've written over here. Um, and what we're going to do is just execute that execute anonymous script. And we can see here in the uh, output of it that it did indeed figure out that it should call the default uh, method the first time. And when it was the awesome implementation, it called the awesome version of the method that was overridden, which is super cool. And this, quite frankly, only scratches the surface of how cool this can be. Uh, again, that interface uh, video that I made a while back, which I'll link in the comments, or sorry, <laughs> link in the description, goes over this in way more detail with way cooler stuff. And we'll go over this in more detail as well as we uh, work through the uh, four pillars here together in their individual videos. But um, yeah, really cool stuff allows your object to kind of take multiple forms at runtime. Now, the other option uh, that you have for polymorphism is um, called compile time polymorphism. It's not quite as cool, but it's still pretty cool. And you do that through the use of constructors. So for instance, uh, if you don't know what the constructors are, I do have a video over constructors that goes into, you know, great detail. But basically, if you wanted this object to be constructed in different ways or built in different ways, you can do so through constructors. <clears throat> Though I will say this is useful. You do have to be careful with this because it can get a little out of control. And again, we'll go over this more in the video all about polymorphism. But I've got this one task object constructor here. And uh, we'll just keep this simple. And I'll say system debug um, constructor one. And then we've got task object another one here. And uh, we'll just make it a new constructor by changing the parameters or adding parameters. Um, and then we will in here say system.debug constructor.
And um, we will save this. And I'm going to display source to org. And once that's done, I'll just show you a quick example of how this works. I think it is done. It's pretty quick. Um, override conflicts and deploy. And then basically what we're going to do here is say new task object and pass it in, you know, carry or something, some string, doesn't really matter. And we'll save this. And we are going to I've got to actually deploy this to the org. And um, now we are going to run our anonymous apex again. It uh, failed to run. What did I do here? Right. I need to uh, make both of these public. That's important. Or it's going to complain because by default these are protected and uh, they would not be visible. So <laughs> those keywords are important. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and deploy this to org again. Yep. And uh, we should be good to go now. So let's uh, go on ahead, run this. It successfully ran, which is great. But I did still need to deploy the task distributor. So we're going to go ahead and do that one more time. And um, <clears throat> we will run this one last time and hopefully we see the right output <laughs> which we do okay cool so uh we see i was looking for a constructor too and i saw constructor s um okay so we've got constructor one and constructor s which should have been two uh and uh yeah i don't know how i did that but anyway <laughs> you can see that polymorphism um uh, compile time polymorph polymorphism, which is pretty cool. So your object can take on multiple forms through those constructors. And the point of constructors is to construct your object, you know, prep the construction of your object for, you know, uh, be before you start using it. So um, again, there's a video over constructors. If you don't know uh, exactly what they are, what they're used for, um, I go in much more detail there. And uh, yeah, so I think that's probably all you need to know about object-oriented programming for now. There's plenty more to say. And again, I'll make a video going over each pillar of object-oriented programming because there's plenty more that needs to be said there. Um, but for now, that's it. I hope it helps, and I will see you in the next video.